Do you like old cartoons? If your first reaction is to talk about gummy bears or ducktails, you're about 70 years off the mark. I'm, uh, I'm talking about television before color. Back when uh, just moving images on the screen, it was novel enough to draw a crowd. You felt this, you know, you know this. There's something different about those old cartoons, a sense of depth, a sense of real momentum and weight. It felt strange, didn't it? Beyond the dated references, the comedy, the official stories, lithographic backgrounds, shadow boxes, a bunch of other film geek horse shit. <laughs> That's 90% of people believe they don't understand. The other 10%, they don't care. We were long past any of those techniques being useful. But ask yourself this. Why did animation turn to shit sometime in the 50s? How does it make sense that we went from Popeye to Clutch Cargo? From images you could feel the depth of the flat, static, almost puppet-like cartoon. I'm, uh, I'm Ethan Benson. I, uh, I've proudly served in two world wars, but gradually stomped through a few more scuffles from my retirement from Uncle Sam's family business. Probably a contender for the oldest man alive. You'll never see me on the second last page of a newspaper, though. Once I got away from the service, I did everything I could do to live a life as small and out of the way as possible. I came to the conclusion last year that being able to get my own mail and wipe my own ass doesn't mean I still have a couple of decades left. The old war machine's falling apart. Before I do, I want to share some things with you. At this point, I have nothing to lose. Most people will think I'm just a crazy old bastard. The rest, the rest of the... What are the G-men going to do when they catch wind? Kill me? <laughs> they manage to find enough functioning nerves to torture. I have done a better job than my last two doctors, so good on them. What I'm saying is I got nothing to lose. Maybe... Maybe I got something to give. It was 1922, a few years after my life meant something in a decade and a half for it would again. No wife, no kids. I wasn't a drifter, not for lack of trying. Something kept bringing me back to a small town in Michigan year after year, though. Didn't take to being a soldier during peacetime, not as a young man anyway. I preferred to make make money here and there, you know, see what my my country had to offer. I sat eating my lunch on a park bench watching folks without heads, full of things they shouldn't have seen walk around blissfully unaware of the cruelty of their fellow man. I recognized the man that sat down beside me, but it didn't make me any less suspicious. There's a war broke out I haven't heard of, I said, lighting up a cigarette. The man that sat beside me in the soldier is the kind of guy who goes by a last name. He was assigned after training. He briefed me a few times after some of the thickest shit I ever had to wade through. Asked me questions I didn't understand and expected answers I didn't have. No corporal, just an opportunity. The man I knew as Mr. Thompson said. What do you know of animation? Cartoons? Kid stuff, I said, looking forward, not making eye contact. Maybe. Maybe, but it's big business, Hiram, Thomas said. Ethan. I corrected. My mistake. Ethan, there's a man looking to make a legacy selling cartoons. This man has a friend powerful enough to make this happen. Someone who eats at the same tables as my bosses do. He's looking to be the Henry Ford of what he does. He isn't the first, but he aims to be the biggest and the best. He has his artists, he has his inventors, and now he needs a few men like yourself to make sure those guys can do their jobs. I didn't like the way Thompson talks. He'd taken up a lot of my time to say very little. Let's get to brass tacks here. Why in the Lord's name would a bunch of civilian doodlers need me? I said, standing up to throw away the remains of my lunch. Well, that's not something I could say to someone who hasn't signed on. Every man has a price, even for an unknown task. I think I know what yours is. Thompson doesn't sound smug, just... Sure. He was right. I figured that if I ended up in some kind of sex crime or aiding at folks that didn't deserve it, I could simply turn around and walk away. 
Thompson was right. I wasn't. When the hell is that thing? I say, pointing to a contraption worn by one of the crew. Assumed it was to be a weapon of some kind. It was a backpack full of humming electronics connected to what looked like the business end of a flamethrower. Instead of a nozzle, it's a massive square camera lens. Leroy was a black man in his early 30s, wearing the thing like he's used to it, testing out the range of motion of the rig as he answered me. The most advanced rotoscope money can buy. This little darling has hours of recording time and lets us edit the raw footage within a couple of hours. If the place is interesting enough, Pierre, the director, said. He's a rat-like, cruel-looking little man. Without a hint of French accent, despite his claims to have lived there most of his life. Among the half-dozen crew, there's a couple of chuckles. But most silently go about checking film gear that I can't even guess the function of. We're kitting ourselves up in a dark warehouse, getting ready to be driven in the back of what looks like a paddy wagon. Thompson watches us all. I hate his eyes. Not his scrutinizing, but not showing a damn hint of what the man was thinking. Ezekiel Greenberg, bi biologist, a man with thick glasses and greased down parted hair, says, offering his hand. The hell is that? I said, shaking his hand. He has a grip like wet bread. Someone who studies living things, uh, a man of science, Ezekiel clarifies. Uh, Shalom, Zeke. Why do we need someone like that for making a cartoon, I asked. Everyone, Thompson said, loud enough to catch our attention. He motions us over. Other than going to some shithole close to four hours away, do we get to know what we're doing now? A tall, olive-skinned woman says. Sylvia was her name. A few trinkets hang from her wrists. And eclectic combination of various religious symbols. I assume that was clear. Pierre and Leroy will be collecting footage. Ezekiel will be taking notes. The rest of you will be ensuring this happens in a safe fashion. You need to understand, everything from the wildlife to the environment itself is going to be hostile towards you. This place isn't somewhere you get by accident. Not a place man was meant to be. You've been encountering threats of a physical, mental, and even possibly spiritual nature. Thompson starts. The last member of the squad was a tall, square-jawed man named Chauncey. Looks like a fighter, but more likely someone that got his scars in a back alley, not a battlefield. He wears a white shirt, black suspenders, and one of those pork pie hats that the Brits seem to like. Spiritual, the tall man scoffs. A smirk cracks his pale, scarred face. Thompson shrugs. If you believe in that kind of thing anyway... Our client's looking for a great reward. You're all being compensated for the great risk. Anything else? Well, you'll understand when you arrive. Speed and discretion are the order of the day, people. We barely fit ourselves inside the cramped van. And after what I'd put, it's somewhere around six hours of ass-destroying potholes and rough terrain. We arrive. We exit the paddy wagon and enter what seems to be a huge cave. It's dim but not dark, but a half-click ahead of us is daylight. Thompson has me running light, some kind of Dane submachine gun, a Thompson pistol, and a couple of smoke grenades. Chauncey now wears a cargo vest, hiking boots, and sports nothing more warlike than a large curved handled knife. As we approach the exit of the cave, my mind conjured up all kinds of things, some mundane, some paranormal, all horrifying. But what I saw when we left the safety of the damp rock made, made all those look like pleasant daydreams. The reek hit me first. A low, deep smell of industrial waste and rot. Chemical tang and fetid miasma trying to outdo each other for the title of world's most offensive odor. And my brain struggled to make sense of the sheer amount of motion I was seeing. I'm going to call whatever we find ourselves a forest, but god damn that. Only because there's no other word I can think of that would fit the bill. Like calling a porcupine a thumbtack, really. All around us were tall, whip-like, dirty, gray, not quite wooden things. Each bounced and swayed as if dancing to the beat of some song we couldn't hear. 
It seemed impossible. Sheer weight of the thing should be tearing apart the hard-packed red-tinted soil. Ezekiel, despite looking like a poindexter, runs fearlessly over to one of the trees, scratches at it with a small pocket knife, pushes it with his hand. It's rock solid, he says, having to duck to avoid an especially low sway. That's great, Zeke. But get the hell away from it, I say, doing my best drill sergeant impression. He actually takes a couple of seconds to mull it over before getting back with the group. Leroy, get about 15 minutes of this for B-roll, Pierre demands. Leroy sighs and the machine he's lugging starts to hum as he aims it around us. Chauncey pulls out a map. I see the mountain, body of water, forest. We have about two kilometer hike before we get to the river. I suggest making as little noise as possible as we do so, the scarred man says, glowering at Pierre. You been here before? I asked. I've been to every jungle on Earth, this being the only exception. Wiggling trees or not, it's no more dangerous than any of them, Chauncey answered. The forest is full of things, and if I describe them all, we'll be here all night. But each and every one of them seems like an attempt or a mockery of something natural. Fleshy rocks that seem to be grinning or scowling at the right angle. Four-legged deer-like things with massive human eyes and bobbing tiny heads, or even small flitting insects that seem to whisper as they buzz by. The place feels weird, menacing, and in a way I can't describe purpose-built. My heart pounds and I grip the SMG. I don't like the look of the wildlife beyond the obvious. They seem smart. There's a hint of understanding behind every twisted, manic creature's eyes. I notice Sylvia taking something from a small brass container and dropping it on the ground every so often. Breadcrumbs? I think the big guy's here to find our way back, I say, trying to start a conversation to keep my mind off this nightmare. The ashes of a holy man, she said. Roma, I guess, and I said, trying to place her accent. Gypsy. I'm proud of it, she says, spitting on the ground. That's for the Roma. I chuckle. Think that stuff's gonna keep us safe? I ask, as something in the tree line catches my eye. Let's hope we don't have to find out. I like her answer, but not the implication. I start to wonder why I'm feeling seasick, but Leroy brings up the topic first. There's no horizon. He says fearfully. And the man isn't wrong. As the forest begins to thin, there's no end in sight, no curve at which you could see. I can make out structures, water, and islands from what must be hundreds of kilometers away. Ezekiel seems enraptured. This place, it can't exist, he says, taking notes as we walk. It's just an impossibility. Even if there were a place flat enough, where could it be? We're seeing sun, so we can't be underground. Completely fascinating. I hate the bookworm's glee, but he isn't wrong. It takes us almost until the tree line to notice the bodies. They're entwined with the roots of the dancing, swaying, tree-like things, looking half-eaten, faces frozen for eternity or slightly twitching in their last moments of life. Obviously, we're going to need to get rid of those, Pierre says. His callousness makes me want to break his jaw. People live out here, I say, half to myself. These people were either brought here or came here, Chauncey says, matter-of-factly. Wherever we are, it's far away from the States. I doubt if there were folks who called this place home, they'd be wearing dungarees and shirts we've all seen at the Woolworths. My head is on a swivel as we hit the tree line, finally getting a clear view of the massive body of murky green water and the floating carnival of horror that it held. The ships had no sense of conformity, each a unique, impossible barge of rotten wood, rusted steel, and what appeared to be worked human remains. We could have chose any number of the hundreds floating by. Each was its own impossibly buoyant war crime. But Pierre pointed out one that bore a slight resemblance to an old-fashioned steamboat. If you squinted real hard, 
Horsetooth pipes belched thick, almost inky black from its roof. They snap and fight with each other like stray dogs. Its helm was a squat, pug-faced, almost goblinoid thing. Its skin was shadow black with weeping gray sores. The worst gore-stained overalls cut into short pants. In the front of it is a breaking wheel, some poor soul bound to it, screaming as the manic creature twists the torturing implement, sending the barge on a crazy zigzagging journey. Pierre looks rapt, swaying Leroy in the arm, pointing. Say what you will about my reasons for signing up. Watching this bastard get his jollies, watching someone be slowly torn apart. It makes my trigger finger itch. Behind the first creature comes a second, a massive flesh mountain of a thing, clad in a robe of sorts, stitched together from what must be the outfits of a dozen people. The interaction's brutal. Half fight, half conversation, but as the massive one takes the wheel, we notice none of the horrific blows caused any kind of lasting harm. Think your pistol and knives will keep us safe? Sylvia says with a smirk. She pats a black velvet bag at her side. If we just get the footage and get out of here, we don't need to be kept safe, Sansi says. We slowly creep along the tree line following the barge. Its destination seems to be a long dock. Its wood is pale, warped. Its timber sways slightly. The ship pulls up in a strange device and kind of harness on an almost gallows-like structure swings towards the barge of its own accord. The two fiends open a hatch in the deck and drag forth something no horror of war before or since could match. Two people, torn apart, crudely stitched back together into a four-legged, almost bovine abomination. This wasn't some Frankenstein's monster, some marvel of a mad mind. Uh, as it was dragged and slammed into the harness, it became crystal clear this was just two poor folks, ripped apart, jammed together, living their final moments racked in pain, confused and crippled. Both things stand covered in gore, grinning, inflicting damage upon each other in celebration of whatever the hell they just did. The two corpses twist and scream as the harness slides down the dock with a wooden grating noise. Chauncey's trying to look unfazed. Ezekiel looks about two seconds away from a heart attack. I close my eyes trying to find some sense of calm, some sense of reality in this mess. We need to go. Now, Sylvia says. I open my eyes and see why. Both of the things, two, maybe three kilometers away, seem to be staring directly at us. Stay calm. They could be looking at anything, Chauncey says. The small, almost rodent-like one waves. Pierre tries to protest, but before we can get started, I slam the butt of the SMG into the bridge of his nose. His demands turn to a scream, and I grab him and shove the insufferable little prick back the way he came. We sprint. The forest around us begins to go mad with motion. Behind us, a deafening roar of water and rage. I can't help but look. The ship raises itself on tubular, pulsating legs, hundreds of meters long, and bears a giant, idiot grin. It's maw, square-toothed and flanked by massive doll-like eyes. The creatures aboard play instruments constructed of flesh and bone, the racket still audible over the displaced water in supernatural rage. As we sprint towards the mouth of the cave, we hear the other smaller noises all around us. I see the rat-like evil little prick turn around, and the look on his face tells me he hasn't learned his lesson. I grab a fistful of shirt and intend to put him out and sling the half a man over my shoulder. When I do, he shoves something in my face. I know what it is, and I let go of the evil little man. There's a charge in the rotoscope capable of destroying everything within 200 feet. Leroy, get me footage of that thing. We did not come here to fail. Pierre grins as he talks. Leroy listens. The sounds around us get closer. Why? Just answer me that, I said. Because I believe in Mr. D. I believe in his vision, and if that costs me my life, then so be it is his reply. Little Prick looks like a cult member. Chauncey takes off his vest, drawing a massive knife. Sylvia begins to take items out of her bag and begins to recite something in a language I've never heard. A dozen or so things come out of the forest, no bigger than a dog, almost perfect clones of the small rodent-like thing on the ship. 
They all dress in motley, each seeming to be a different profession. One looks like a doctor, another a dock worker. Third might be a waiter or an usher. They swarm the massive man, but in an instant I can tell the guy is used to dealing with dangerous creatures. He moves, he stabs with his knife, never getting too close. After a few seconds we can see the small creatures nowhere near as resilient as the one on the barge. I try to get an angle for a shot, but I, I don't feel confident I could do it without hitting Chansey. But he doesn't seem to need the help. Tiny, onyx, pock-filled limbs fly, screaming, goblin little creatures hit the dirt. Sylvia's chant reaches a crescendo. I feel pressure. Objects she placed around here begin to rattle. The ship is close now, maybe a half a kilometer away and closing fast, faster than Chauncey's dodge. The big man stumbles, a piece missing from the back of his thigh before he can regain his stance. Two, then three of the things are on him. They make short work of him once he hits the ground. The man's gutted like a trout in seconds. Stay close, Sylvia says. She stands with her eyes closed, sweat starting to bead on her brow. More footage, Pierre screams. Leroy says something to him in French. All I made out was... Murday. You stand next to Sylvia as the things start to close in. The boat looms like the face of God himself, but something is keeping this unholy horde away about twenty feet from us. I fire a burst at the boat. I might as well have spit at it. Another of the crowd of cloned rats, but they move long before the rounds hit. Sylvia begins to slowly walk backwards, the monsters advancing with her pace. How long could you keep this up? I ask. I don't know. Less if I have to keep talking, she says curtly. The pace is slow, but we can't be more than a hundred meters from the mouth of the cave. Sylvia stumbles for a moment. The pressure around us begins to lighten. She sweeps one arm out, trying to regain balance. I saw nothing but a blur, then in an instant... Sylvia's arm was pierced by the tip of one of the tree-like thing branches. She's dragged into the air, screaming, blood from her arm, falling like rain. I try to shoot the branch, sparks, noise. Nothing more. The horde takes its time, closing in like nightfall. I change magazines. What are we gonna do? Ezekiel screams. I take in a deep breath, line up my target, and hope my sharpshooting skills are too rusty. The burst severs her arm. I drop the weapon, doing my best to cushion her fall. Two ribs crack. I scream as we hit the ground. Zeke, to his credit, begins to dress the wound immediately. Judging by the small medical kit he had on him, he probably has enough skill to do the job well enough so we can find a hospital. This is no monster, Hiram, Sylvia says, pain making her words clipped. So we're fucked, I say, assuming the obvious. I have no word or command that will sway them. They may accept a sacrifice, she says. But I hesitate. Some people need killing. That's not what bothers me. But looking at these things, these impossible, powerful things, I understand what I'm doing. I'm not killing a man. I'm making a sacrifice to things that are either demons or close enough to it that it doesn't matter. But if I don't... Here, I'm going to make you an offer. We duke it out, and whichever one of us is left standing gets to walk away. I say standing. It'll end us all before I let you lay a hand on me, the smug little shit says, brandishing the detonator. My knife isn't as big as Chauncey's, but it's sharp, and small enough to conceal up a sleeve. The detonator falls as the blade severs the tendons in Pierre's wrist. He tries to come at me. I let him. For a few seconds, I take his blows. My lip splits. A cracked rib pulses with pain. And then I aim the pistol downward. It turns his kneecap into a dripping rose of bone and flesh. I turn to face the horn. The barge itself lowers its body, staring at us two feet away. Rank seawater breath hits us like a mortar. As I talk, Sylvia repeats what I say in that same landless language. Is yours. I... Hiram Benson, give you this man in exchange. We leave, I say, trying to make eye contact with the demonic construct. I felt something then, like a bloom of sadness deep inside my brain, a cold, dim spot that never really went away. Turn around, slowly, Sylvia says, putting one arm around my shoulder. We make it back to the cave, and to that same warehouse, leaving parts of our bodies and 
likely souls behind. Be looking for a happy ending. Well, we all got paid, and for what it's worth, Sylvia made it through real surgery. But the thing is, that ain't the end. No, see, here's where you need to worry. Those things we so ignorantly recorded, those things that are... that have a part of my soul. They were more than we knew. Their danger wasn't limited to claws and teeth, see. Some of them, they can live in images, a piece of themselves stays in every copy. Kids, there are a lot of copies. Mr. D and the others, they sent plenty of teams just like mine to those places. Layered a happy face over the frantic evil, put them in homes, theaters, schools across the world. In fact, I bet a lot of you have one or two sitting around right now. DVD bought at a bargain bin, maybe a video you watched on YouTube. You felt it, you've seen it. And now you understand it. My advice is just let these things die. Let these macabre melodies get lost in time. Don't go searching for old cartoons to see if you can catch a glimpse, an untouched frame of pure evil. I've never been one to turn on a paycheck. If you folks need any more lessons from an old man who might not see summer, let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, otherwise I hope you're the first generation to actually listen to your elders. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primarch, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.